Testing one, two, three. All right, welcome everyone. I hope you guys all enjoyed that tasting from today's book. Uh, you guys were able to eat eat like you give a fork uh, by Chef Maria. But let me go ahead and tell you a little about Maria. Uh, Maria Abrams is a chef, a holistic nutritionalist, award-winning entrepreneur, and a solo mother of two. As a nutritionalist and an award-winning in inventor, and chef in which she designed the meal plan and detox plan for the million copy New York bestseller, The Daniel Plan, and also serves as one of the signature chefs for the program. However, in this case, this is Maria's actually her first solo book, Eat Like You Give a Fork, The Real Dish on Eating to Thrive. Um, with over 25 years in the food industry and a host of the popular Facebook live show, The Real Dish, as well as the podcast, Recipes for Your Best Life. Maria's knowledge and guidance and great palate will make readers rethink the world diet. Now, Maria has been a great friend of mine and uh, a fan and friend of Melissa's Produce over the years, and I'm proud to have her here with her new book. I'm going to turn it over to Chef Maria. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Um, it's a great honor to be here with you all today. And uh, I just can't thank Melissa's Produce enough for all of their support of my endeavors over the years. And um, I, I want to kind of give a couple of other shout outs as well. First of all, Chef Sally that's here in the front row uh, was my collaborator on the photo shoot for the book. So a lot of the styling that you see, we chef together. And we did create every single recipe in this book. I think sometimes you see uh, a book that's styled or you see it photographed and the chef really had nothing to do with the actual shoot. We were there every day doing it. So um, what you see is real food in front of you. It's food that you can make in your kitchen. And I want to emphasize that because we live in a world right now where there are a lot of beautiful pictures out there, but is it real food? Is it food that you can enjoy with your family at home? And I, I'm very proud that this book is something that you can do. Um, I would be remiss, though, if I didn't give kudos to somebody else in this room. She's not actually here, but she's on the wall. Her name is Julia Child. And when I was growing up, I'm Middle Eastern, I'm Egyptian, and uh, my dad, he's a scientist, he's a very smart man. And so consequently, he thought TV was a waste of time. <laughs> and so we had the choice of three channels because we didn't have cable. We had Wild Animal Kingdom. Does anybody remember that? Oh, yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> Mickey's like, I remember. Uh, <laughs> we had Nova because my dad's a scientist. And we had PBS. And so Julia Child would come on in her quirky six foot two body, very opposite me. I'm on a platform right now. And uh, she just exuded charm and passion and what I call a zest for life that just can't be described any other way but joy. And I want to ask you guys, when you think about food, do you think joy or do you think deprivation? Diet. Ugh, that's not fun. Food is fun. It's colorful. Did you guys enjoy the lunch today? Yeah. yeah? Was there any hint of deprivation there? I think a D word we could add to this is dessert. I mean, really, you know? And what Julia taught us is that you never separate the two. You can still have all of this beautiful abundance, but let's not get tripped up on the terms. We don't need to label ourselves. We don't need to wear it on our chest as a badge of honor, saying we're paleo or vegan or, or keto or any myriad of things. Let's just say we love fresh food. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Fresh food is where it's at. And it starts with fresh produce. And that's why I've been such a fan of Melissa's Produce for so long, is they believe that at the cornerstone of every eating plan, is fresh produce, an abundance of it. You saw a rainbow in front of you, and that is 
have to work with as chefs, as home chefs, as eaters. If you don't see color and abundance on your plate, there's something missing because that is what's feeding you to the core. It's feeding your eyes. It's feeding your emotions. It's feeding your taste buds, of course, and it's feeding your palate. And so with the book, Eat Like You Give a Fork, I want you to really think, what does that title mean? Well, I'll share with you what my intention was. I didn't set out to write a cookbook because there are a lot of other better chefs that could teach you how to cook, but I can teach you how to eat and I can add the chef touches to it to make it a pleasurable experience. But there are eight core strategies that we overview in the book. Why? Because you are an omnivore and choices are abundant and it gets so confusing. What do I pick? What's healthy? What does healthy even mean? It can mean so many different things to so many people. You know, I, I get asked this question a lot. Well, are you, uh, so you must be a vegetarian. Well, no, I'm not. I'm an omnivore. However, there are strategies that help you eat to boost your metabolism, lower inflammation, help give you energy so that you thrive and help you in the long run. Because at the end of the day, you invest in your health now or you pay for it later. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> I'm gonna share a very personal story with you. I lost my mother a month and a half ago. She died of a massive stroke. And as much as I loved her and tried to help her with her eating habits for decades, unless you're ready, unless you take the step and you change and you adopt a healthier, better for you lifestyle, Nobody can do it for you. So guess what I talk about in the beginning of the book before we even talk about the strategies? What's your BHAG? Does anybody know what a BHAG is? It's a big, hairy, audacious goal. What do you want in your life? You were put on this earth to be so much. Do you have so much in you? So what's your BHAG? Think about that. Take a minute, actually, as we're talking today, and I want you to write down, uh, maybe put it in your phone, write it down in your own handwriting. What's your BHAG? This book was my BHAG. I, I could just, I could cry. I'm so emotional right now. This was my BHAG. I took 27 years to write this book. It started when I was a little girl and I would go to the market with my grandfather and he'd walk me in through the, the streets of Alexandria, Egypt, and he'd show me how to pick fish. You never pick fish without the eyes in it, he would say. Look at the eyes. And he would show me how to purchase a, a melon, how to know it was ripe. And he would teach me how to pick spices from, from the spice bazaar. And food was a celebration. We would come back and we would eat together. And, you know, my parents immigrated. They came to the United States with nothing. I was two. Uh, we, we landed in Queens. My dad said he finally had found home in Queens. I call him the king of Queens now. And, um, and he, you know, we would go buy fresh fish in Brooklyn from the, the, the fishermen that would dock there. And we would have parties. And my parents would, it would just be fun. It would be a celebration. Now, you may not be able to have a party at your house every night. I understand that. But you can have a party in your mouth. Don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> Food is fun. Let it be fun. Let it be vibrant. Experience it. It's the only art form you get to experience with all five senses. How lucky are we? We get to do that multiple times a day. So... This book is eight strategies, and it starts with a taste bud reset. Does anybody know why I start with something that you've never heard before? Why do I want you to reset your taste buds? I'll give $20 to the first person who answers. I got 20 bucks in my wallet. I think that's about all I've got right now. Yes? Natural. Jody, you get the happy face, the big star. That's exactly right. And the truth is, your taste buds are actually conditioned by the time you're about four years old. So guess what? When free will set in and you were like, I want sugar, I want treats, 
but you grew up eating vegetables and all and mother's perfect milk, which is umami, and then free will sets in, that's what your parents are going to give you because it's just easier. Unless you've got parents who really stick by their guns and say, you're going to eat the vegetables and you're going to stay with eating all these you know, nutritious foods, it does change. So we're starting by making your muscles strong. No more wimpy muscles. No more wimpy taste buds. When you strengthen your taste buds to crave bitter and sour and umami, just think mommy, breast milk, mommy. <laughs> it's umami. When you crave those flavors, just what we were talking about, you let go of the extreme sweet and the extreme salt that completely takes over when you walk into almost every grocery store and see what we have packaged on the shelves. Even when you buy frozen foods, when you go out to eat, I would guarantee you, just take a look at the labels and see how much sodium is going in there. So when we get intentional, we, we choose correctly. We, choo we navigate the aisles in a way that fits our body. So we start with that. And I, I walk you through a taste bud reset, and I would highly, highly encourage you guys to try this because you may be thinking, well, I really like these foods, but I don't like these foods. This will get you to actually crave, not just want to eat, but crave greens. Imagine that. Imagine wanting to eat broccoli over a brownie. Not to say that the brownies, there's anything wrong with it, but there's a place for it. It's just not in the beginning of this book. I'll talk about that in a minute. So we start there, and then we go on to stocking your real kitchen. Because just like a great wardrobe, and ladies, when you look in your wardrobe and you're like, I have nothing to wear, what do you do? You go buy something. Or you call a girlfriend and you say, can I borrow something? Or, or you buy something, <laughs> most likely. And when you go home, I want you to look in your refrigerator. And if what's staring at you is a few sad ketchup packets and some diet soda, no shame in that game, but it's time to overhaul. Your fresh wardrobe starts in your refrigerator because when you set yourself up in a place where you can mix and match and you're looking at color and green and reds and oranges and yellow, you're going to have an appetite to want to use it. Now, one of, one of the things when Robert introduced me, he said she's an entrepreneur, I actually started in the food industry 27 years ago, but uh, what kind of set me on this track to wanting to write this book just now is my company, and it's called Eat Cleaner. And I highly encourage you to check out eatcleaner.com. We're the creators of a whole line of patented products that naturally help to remove pesticide residue, wax, and, and the junk that can carry bacteria that can really make you sick. And when you are feasting on a variety of fresh produce and you're eating raw, it's very, very important that you pay attention to food safety. In cooking school, it's the first thing that we do. We study food safety. It's not what home chefs do. And this is not about a scare tactic, but I will share with you that over 48 million people get sick from foodborne illness in the US every single year. And guess what the number one cause is? Anybody know? What food item? It's leafy greens. So if you don't wash properly, you put yourself and your family at risk. So why do that? So we created a way to do that. And you've got samples in your goodie bags. And you're welcome to take a look at our other products on the table and ask me any questions. So we get your real kitchen in order. And then the third very important strategy, we get up on greens. Greens are the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. So I want you to eat them clean, but I want you to eat a lot of them. And when you incorporate like this beautiful sauce that we're about to make, the chimichurri, you've got, you know, your herbal greens, you've got vegetables, you've, you've got that bitter flavor that you actually start to crave. You're going to want to incorporate those into your foods more. And when people say to me, I, don't, I really don't have a taste for green vegetables, I always say, well, have you tried it? sauteed? Have you tried it baked with this? Have you tried it grilled with that? Like, don't give up on yourself or your family. There's a bazillion ways to do it. And if you really can't look at it, put it in a smoothie, <laughs> you know, put it in a sauce, put it in a soup. 
there's a myriad of ways to enjoy. And I go into that in great detail in the book. And I also talk about how to handle greens because there are different categories of greens. And I equate them to your friends. You know, you've got your really easygoing friends, you know, the mild friends that, what do you want to do tonight? Oh, let's go grab, you know, dinner. We'll go to a movie or we'll cook. Okay, cool. And then you've got your maybe not so easy friends that need a little more massaging, like your kale. <laughs> kale needs to be massaged. It needs to be worked a little bit. Um, and then you've got your maybe more prickly friends that need a little bit more massaging, like your chicory. <laughs> you know, those are your friends that need a little bit more work. Maybe they need a little bit of cooking or steaming or something like that. So we go into that in that chapter. And then we go on to build your food warehouse, your food wardrobe from there. We talk about nutrient dense add ons. We talk about super dense single ingredient grains. You know, a lot of people out there say that grains should go away from your wardrobe. I am going to raise my hand and say I highly, highly disagree. It's all about what grains you're picking. Pick unprocessed, as close to as nature intended greens, the uh, grains, the ones that um, you can incorporate into so many different dishes. And if you're restricted dietarily, you're a vegetarian or you're a vegan, you really need to pay attention to this part. Because at the core, this whole book is based on getting your essential amino acids into your everyday. Do you know this body of yours is an incredible machine? And it doesn't need a lot, but there are essential, that's why they call them essential amino acids. And people who weight train and bodybuild and do body sculpting and stuff, they live and die by this. This is how they build muscle. This is how they burn fat. This is how they build their metabolism. Will you get to get that without even know, having to know what one essential amino acid is? Because every single recipe has that baked into it. But you need them every day. You need them to thrive. You need them to regulate your hormones. You need them to build your muscle. And especially as we age, that becomes that much more important. You need it for, you know, that bomb chicka wah, -wah. So your partner isn't like, what's going on? You know? It could be the essential amino acids, babe. Here, <laughs> eat this. So you need that. Your body does not create all of those on their own, and you need to get them from food. That's why this book will become, I hope, your roadmap. I'm not going to use the word viable. Sorry, God. Um, but it is your foundation. It's your food foundation. It's not a huge book. You lift it up. It, it doesn't weigh like 20 pounds but it's the book that you will use all the time and it will be your resource. Um, so let me fast forward because you'll be able to read through all of the strategies. The last one is pretty exciting and then we're gonna get cooking. The last strategy, you guys, is the 90-10 rule. Does anybody wanna take a guess? Don't cheat by looking in your book. What does the 90-10 rule mean? Close. 10% indulgence. And what's 90%? The book. The strategies in the book. So the seven strategies that are in the book, you eat and repeat to infinity. That's why one of the little sections is called I ate to infinity. Little play on words. You turn the eight on its side and it's the infinity side. That's why it's eight strategies. Um, but the 90-10 the rule is because you're human. Because you are a person that is in community with other people. You get to celebrate. Last night, I celebrated my daughter's 18th birth for the fourth time <laughs> with her grandparents. And one of the things, one of the dishes that her grandmother is famous for is carrot cake. Do you think I ate the carrot cake? Fork, yeah, I did. There was no way I was gonna say no. Do you think I felt guilty? Fork, no, I didn't. Should you? Not for a second, not for a second. Because you know how much I ate? I ate a portion about this big, because that was enough. I was satisfied, I was happy with it, it was delicious, it was perfect. And that's what happens. When you incorporate the, the seven strategies in the book and you retrain your palate, that 10% indulgence becomes really like, I want you to pick the things that you really love. Don't cheat yourself. Don't just, it's not a low fat thing. It's not a sugar free thing. It's just what you love. And um, 
uh, last or two years ago, I went to an event with my daughter. It was, I'm going to get, I'm going to start cooking because I've been talking a lot. Um, I went to an event with my daughter and uh, it was for the American Cancer Society. And we had food from a number of different chefs. And uh, I was really excited. I had this you know, a dinner for six that was uh, on auction. The actress Allison Janney had uh, had won. She became my new BFF. She's like six two. I like really tall people in my like my boyfriend over there is like really tall. Um, and uh, and so we were chatting, and she. Um, where was I going? Oh, uh, and then we went to look at the food, and it was just gorgeous. But we ended up landing on the booth that had ravioli. And this was not ordinary ravioli. This was like decadent. Just be, come with me on this journey. More little buttery morsels of lobster enveloped in perfect pillows of handmade pasta, which is that pecorino shaved on top and a crown of black truffles. I died. I died. Like, Heaven, like the world stopped rotating at that moment. And I heard the angels sing. And that's what happens when you allow yourself to indulge in what you love that 10% of the time. Guess how many ravioli I had? I could have had like 20 dozen. I had three because they were so good. And I was smelling it. Smell your food before you cook it. You know, hold it up. It has its own character. And when you smell it and you taste it and you experience it, it's not about just inhaling it. It's about being part of it. So that's what happens when you get all the strategies in order. So what am I, let me focus on cooking right now so I can actually show you guys what we're doing. We're making the chimichurri skewers that you guys had with the shrimp and shishito peppers. And I've got my little tomatoes and my my uh, shishito peppers in here, which Melissa's Produce is well known for their shishito peppers. And that's no shishito show. All right. Um, And then I have my shrimp. Please use wild caught shrimp whenever you can. I had an incident that happened recently where I literally, my face blew up like three times the size uh, because I found out the shrimp that I had had was basically, I don't know, it was farm raised in India and it was just not good. So um, make sure you're using wild cotton. What I'm doing is I'm marinating my shrimp and my vegetables in a little bit of fresh lime juice. And I'm just going to come in here with my hands and toss it around a little bit of pepper and a little bit of zest. Zest is magic. This is where you get so many nutrients and vitamins and smell, delicious smell, concentrated flavor. And I'm just going to mix those up with a little bit of oil. I am cooking today on my one of my favorite tools. This is called the smokeless power grill. And ladies in particular, I want you to never be afraid of grilling. Grilling is just another form of cooking. I, I feel like oftentimes people are, you know, oh, my husband does the grilling and I do the, the cooking. Well, why? It's just another form of cooking. And the beautiful thing is this time of year, this is the perfect thing to be able to have very easy cleanup. Um, You've got great flavor. There is nothing like the smell of the grill. And I'm just going to thread these onto my skewer. And I have uh, soaked these skewers for half an hour so we don't torch the place. Has anybody ever done that? Like you put a cedar plank and you haven't soaked it for enough time. You're like, why is there a bonfire in my backyard? Um, So you can do this indoors very easily. And I'm just going to thread these and start putting them on the grill. Oh, that nice sizzle. Isn't that lovely? And after I thread these, I'm going to wash my hands because I'm going to be a good student of food safety today. After you've handled raw proteins, Anytime you handle raw proteins, please wash your hands. Um, We do also make a wash for seafood and poultry at Eat Cleaner, and it's on the table over there. You can take a look at it. Or actually, I have it down here. Can somebody do me a favor and grab that for me? I was going to be so astute and show it to you, and I have it sitting at my feet. So shrimp, very quickly, it's going to cook like literally, I'm going to just make two skewers. I'm going to wash my that's going to take about two minutes on each side, so super fast. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. So this is our seafood and poultry product. Uh, you can mist your seafood and poultry before you cook. It actually helps to marinate and tenderize the food so that it cooks faster. And I think it gives it a really nice flavor and you don't need to rinse it afterwards because the suggestion is that you never rinse, uh, especially poultry because it can splatter and then create problems in your kitchen. So I've washed my hands. I'm gonna move to the, the shrimp to the side. And certainly you could put them directly right on there, but it's kind of fun on the skewer and it makes it easy to move. And then, let's see, I don't think I oiled these yet. The shishitos with the tomatoes are really lovely. And I love that blistered effect that you get. Now, this is not complicated cooking, guys. This is, that's why I told you I'm not teaching you how to cook. I'm just really teaching you how to eat. But I will share that having those delicious natural ingredients at your fingertips are what make your food. Cook with the seasons. Uh, really take time in picking the right ingredients. If you're eating animal proteins, do yourself a favor and do the good stuff. You know, the humanely raised, the sustainably caught, because those foods are eating other foods. So if they're not what they're supposed to, guess what happens? You then suffer from inflammation. And when you're, you think you're doing something really good by eating like salmon, but you're doing the, the farm raised and it's full of omega-6s instead of the omega-3s, you're then doing yourself a disservice. So I'd rather you eat a little bit, oh, I put that on really wonky. Um, I'd rather you eat less of it, but just get the good stuff. And you know, there's very few things that we need in life. One of them is food, so invest in that. You know, in the United States, we spend a lot less on food than they do in other countries, a lot. I'm not saying that you should spend a certain amount or certainly like put yourself in debt, <laughs> but if it's that or like a latte at Starbucks, just saying, like one is going to serve you a lot more than the other. Okay. Oh, uh, those are a little bit more. So I've got my gorgeous color, and I'm going to whip together the chimichurri while we, while we do this. Get that going. Now, chimichurri is not a Middle Eastern recipe, as you guys know. However, it is darn good. And it's very, uh, it's very versatile in that you can serve this with the shrimp. Normally, you would see it like it, you know, in a, a different application, maybe it's served with red meat, for example, but I think it's really wonderful with the shrimp. And if you don't do animal proteins, you can do it with tempeh. I'm a big fan of grilled tempeh, and there is a recipe for that in the book. Um, you can also do that with, uh, you can do that just with vegetables, with grilled vegetable, and do a, just a variety of vegetables, onions and peppers and tomatoes and eggplant, and you'll have a wonderful feast. Maybe sprinkle some hemp seeds over it to give you the essential fatty acids that you need to. Okay, so we've got some, and we've got our, we've got fresh parsley and cilantro for this one. Uh, I have a good friend, if he watches this, he'll be like, why are you using cilantro? He hates cilantro. I'm not gonna call him out, but if he watches this, he'll know I'm talking to him. <laughs> um, and then we, we have a roast pepper in here. And this, you can use Anaheim's, you can use Pasilla peppers, you can use Serrano peppers. It's really kind of up to you, whatever you find again that's in season. And when you, when you do these, you'll roast these until the skins get blistered. And then the technique is you just put them in a plastic bag off very easily. And that's a nice way to be able to use these. We take the seeds out because if you put the seeds in, they become just a little too hot to handle. I'm just gonna get this a little smaller in there. And then I'm gonna add my red pepper flake, a little bit of apple cider vinegar, raw apple cider vinegar, which comes up in the book a lot. I'm a huge fan of it. It dates back to the time of Hippocrates, the father of medicine where he put that ish on everything. You know, it was like the cure all for everything. Um, but the benefits are tremendous and I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but I will say it's worked in my own life for a very long time. This year, you guys, I turned 50. Anybody in the 50 and over club? All right, this is when life starts. <laughs> it's never too late. 
a little bit of lime ju or uh, lemon juice, and then we have some onion. All right. I think I've, did I get every last bit? I wanna make sure I did every last bit. And then I will do a little pepper. How many people are like, they swear by only using a measuring spoon or a measuring cup? Who, anybody in here? Wow, we got some adventurous folks. I like that. I was gonna say, trust, trust your taste buds, you know? Okay, we're gonna get that going. I think, I know I told you two minutes, but sometimes, you know, the grill, uh, it's not, it's got some hot spots here. So I need a little bit longer. Now, certainly if you're doing this outside and you have it on high heat, it's gonna cook a little bit faster. I have this a little lower and slower. All right, Let me get my let's see get my spoon in there. Move that around. Give it one more go. And then, um, and then we're gonna just place this on a nice platter and give it a little drizzle. Now you can serve a little bit of chimichurri on the side, but I highly encourage you like double the recipe because it's one of those things that you can actually freeze. It actually freezes pretty well. You can do it in a little plastic bag and then thaw it. And anytime you can double the recipe, it makes your life that much easier. Um, and you can incorporate the grilled shrimp uh, and all of these uh, vegetables that we've grilled off, toss them into a salad. I really like the contrast of grilled items with the cool, cold, crisp items. So if you have a nice salad, maybe spinach or uh, romaine or butter lettuce, you can toss that with the shrimp. Even the lettuce cups that we had today, uh, the chicken lettuce cups, you could substitute the shrimp and these vegetables in there with a the chimichurri over the top and have a lettuce cup lunch. So lots of ways to mix and match the different recipes. Okay, these look great. And we have our platter. Oh, it's right there. Over there. All right. I have to be careful I don't fall off my platform here, guys. <laughs> Don't want to overcook the shrimp because then they'll get kind of rubbery and not so fun. Super elegant, simple food. You can't beat it. Is this something everybody can make? 100%. Let's see. Where is my little, I'll use a spoon. Has anybody been intimidated by the idea of making a chimichurri? So easy, right? It just sounds fancy. It's not fancy. I'm putting a lot on here because I like it that way. Lots of green. Beautiful. And that's really it, you guys. Simple, right? We just did that chatting today. How's that? You like it? Gorgeous. All right. So that is our grill work. And do you guys feel a little more empowered to use a grill? Was that hard? So easy. Um, and I always recommend, you know, when you, we talked about doubling the batch, but another strategy that we talk about in the book is convertible meals. When you are, you, you're already here, you're already marinating, you're already getting it ready, get 
an extra chicken breast or an extra piece of tuna or an extra salmon uh, filet or whatever you're doing cooked off and then put it into your food wardrobe. And when you go in there, then you know you can grab, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm making lunch for tomorrow. Okay, yeah, I'll grab that. I'll add this. And you start mixing and matching. So what you have in the book is the foundation, but then you get to be creative in how you mix and match. And we give you lots of convertible meal ideas, and that's towards the back of the book. All right, so we're going to put this to the side. My, when I was little, my dad would be outside on the grill, like, we moved from Egypt to New York. I mean, like, from, from the desert heat to, like, 25 below. I don't know. I don't know how they picked that. But um, uh, he would be outside in his parka and boots with the barbecue going and the shawarma and, and kofta and all kinds of stuff. It was just, that was my dad. All right, we can take this one away. Thank you, sir. Can we give it up for the Melissa chefs, though? I mean, the Melissa chefs make me look good. That's what I'm saying. OK, let's clean our area up a little bit. All right, so let's talk about dessert. Can we talk about dessert? Can we dish on dessert? Why do people think you can't have dessert and, and eat to thrive? Why? I, where did we get that idea? You've got chocolate, which is maybe one of the most perfect foods on the planet that's actually good for you, OK? It's just which chocolate are you picking? Are you picking the one that's loaded with sugar and additives and palm oil and all kinds of other stuff that they add to it? Or are you picking the stuff that is pure? Um, today's recipe is really focused on that. It's focused on the combination of cocoa powder. We're using a dark, uh, we're using an unsweetened cocoa powder. And when you pick chocolate, I encourage you to pick 70% or higher um, and try and get the unsweetened. Uh, there's a plentiful choices out there now. It's really amazing what you can find. Um, I'm also using fresh berries. I mean, come on. like the little most little perfect morsel right here this is sweet enough and the truth is so are you give yourself that you're sweet enough uh, <laughs> so we're we're making a berry coulis it sounds very fancy but again it's just it's a little we're we're going to reduce the berry with a little bit of water and add some uh, lemon juice that's really all it is uh, and then we're going to layer that in the dark chocolate avocado mousse, okay? So we're taking basically all of the cream that would normally be in a mousse, and we're adding in the avocado. Um, I'm using an alternative sweetener. I'm using stevia today. You can use monk fruit extract. You can use erythritol. Uh, some people don't like any of those, okay? Use an organic, maybe an organic cane sugar. Um, I'm, I'm okay with the alternatives, though. I'm, I'm actually... I'm good with that. So whatever your personal preference is, this gives you the opportunity to make it sweet, have it as an indulgence, but have it without adding the sugar calories. Um, and then we're also going to top it with the, these are called, I don't want to slaughter this, clean snacks. Thank you. Clean snacks with an X. Isn't that cute? Um, this is Melissa's product. And uh, this is the crumble that was on top of your mousse. Did you guys like it, by the way? I didn't ask you if you liked it. Okay, good. I'm glad, I'm glad you liked it. So I think, how am I doing on time? Five. Five? Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. I'm going to step over here. Um, Five-ish. Okay. So let me set this down. Um, what we're going to do, we've got our lime juice over here. Got my water. Okay. What we're going to we're going to get the berries going, but I'm actually going to cheat it a little bit and show you guys what the final sauce looks like. Did I just turn it out? I did just turn it out, didn't I? Oh, there it is. Okay, it was still going. Awesome. All right. Um, I'm going to add my water, and I'm going to get my berries going. Basically, you're just going to reduce this down again until you get a nice consistency. You can run it through... Uh, 
you can just run it through a little sieve or run it through a little um, a strainer. I'm <laughs> sorry, my brain. Um, run it through a strainer and take your spoon and just run it through the strainer to get the seeds out, and you'll get a nice silky sauce. We're going to let that go for a little bit, and then I'll show you what the final little bit of lemon juice. And you can take the back of your spoon and just give it a little bit of a mash to get it going. Break it down. And the final product looks like this. And you can reduce this down a little bit more so you get it a little bit thicker. But this gives you the idea. And this sauce, when you set it up in your dessert, will set up and it will get nice and thick for you too. But you can, you can reduce this down a little bit more to get it a little bit thick, depending on what you like. All right, let's make the actual dessert. And I'll show you how to layer it in. Super, super simple. Um, before I actually slice into the avocado, I am going to clean the outside. Um, recent, recent reports from the FDA saying that there is a high presence of listeria on the outside avocados. And actually on the outside of most of your produce is really where you want to focus on cleaning, even if you're not eating the peel. Uh, so if you're cutting through it, you're cutting through melons, you're cutting through cantaloupe, uh, you're cutting through whatever, watermelon now that's in season, you want to make sure that you're cleaning the outside first. Because why? What's going to happen? It'll go right to the inside. Yeah. So we want, would you guys mind giving me a cutting board, please? Um, I'm using our wipes right now just because it's a little bit easier. Normally, I would just spray them, let it sit for two minutes, and give it a quick rinse, and I'd wash all, all of my produce at once. This is, this is our treatment for actually cleaning the residue that water can't. Because you think about it, look at the surface of this avocado. If you rinse it, the water is just going to splash over the top. I mean, if you've ever tried to rinse broccoli, it just, just kind of splashes. But thank you. Um, but when you have, when you use the product, it actually helps to cling to it. So I'm going to take, and I'm using the Kangshin knives today. Gorgeous knives, by the way. And I highly encourage you, are they still on our table? Oh, yes. Perfect. I highly encourage you guys to take a look at these knives. They're beautifully designed, Swiss made, very durable. Having a nice knife is so important in your, in your clean eating adventures. That's all I can, I can't say that enough. Um, and the way that the handle feels in your hand is really important. This is, it's really nicely weighted. Um, I've got a variety of knives here for you guys to take a look at too, but having something that you feel comfortable with and having sharp knives is also really important. So I am going to cut into that and just twist out my pit. And if you don't feel comfortable with doing that, there are tools so that you can take out your, uh, your pit also. All right, I'm going to scoop out my avocado fresh. Make sure, am I using half or a whole one in this one? I usually make so much of this, and when you create a yeah, it's the whole one. When you create a recipe for a book, you have to start paying attention to serving size. I'll usually just make a whole bunch of it to last the week, and then they're like, "Well, how many people does that serve?" Oh, well, probably more. <laughs> okay, so we've got our avocado, and then we have our unsweetened cocoa powder going in. Again, these ingredients are the things that I want you to focus on getting the really good stuff. Because a good quality uh, cocoa powder will go the distance for you and you will taste the difference. It's very significant. So I can share some brands with you if you like too. 
And then we've got our sweetener. Got a little bit of water just in case. Now, when you're blending this, or when you're processing it, I like to just put a little splash of water in there just to get it going. Um, and you can modulate the consistency depending on how you like your dessert. If you like it very thick and more like pudding-like, you can keep it on the thicker side. If you're using, and it will also depend on the size of your avocado. Because keep in mind, like one of when I say one avocado or one medium avocado, and you go to the store and you think it's medium and it's actually really big. So you're gonna need to eyeball it a little bit and just kind of adjust the ingredients based on the consistency. Oops, the consistency that you like. My platform almost went out from under me. Goodness. On the other side. Funny thing about blenders and food processors, when you're not using your own, it's still like a complicated puzzle. I don't know why. I've had I should. What's that? What did you say? Oh, <laughs> there you go. Okay, and what you have, guys, look at that. Look at that beautiful, silky chop. Do you see any avocado in there? You guys, this is the best dessert for the picky, finicky eaters in your life because they won't be able to tell. And I won't tell anybody either. I won't tell anybody either. All right, so we're going to layer this in. And again, you could do this in a beautiful flute, a parfait glass, a martini glass. Just have fun with it. Make it pretty. And this would be for two. You could do a little bit of unsweetened shredded coconut over the top. In the book, we talk about using uh, a coconut whip. And after you've layered these, I suggest, like I said, just set it up in the refrigerator so that it gets a little bit thicker for you. Or you can reduce the sauce down a little bit more too. And then you can finish it with the snacks. Let me break this. Crumble it up a little bit. Uh, I like a little more. <laughs> Why not? There we go. All right. So we've got our lovely pudding. We've got a little bit of that great berry on top. You could layer it a little bit differently where you could do alternate layers in a nice parfait glass. Just have fun with it. And uh, nobody's ever going to... I'm telling you, this could be breakfast right? We've got cocoa powder, we've got avocado, we've got a little bit of sweetener, something that tastes almost like granola, a little fruit. You're, you, you, I'm giving you license to have dessert for breakfast right there. <laughs> and there you have it.